Uh, okay. Uh, great. I think uh, we are live and we are global. Um, very glad to have uh, uh, Professor uh, Mihalis Yanakakis uh, as a guest for this uh, live discussion. And uh, like uh, Mihalis is one of the pioneering figure, I will say, especially in theoretical computer science and much beyond, even in databases and verifications. And since I was a PhD student, like at MIT, I think back in 2000, 2001, then uh, I always actually following uh, his papers, even before that, I think when I was even undergrad. So especially his uh, great papers uh, with uh, Professor Christos Pavadimistrio, that's <laughs> generally you had lots of papers together. So uh, that's the thing that I wanted to, I mean, have him and we are very, uh, I mean, happy that have him here for this live. Uh, he has been the head of Bell Labs, uh, uh, like in, more in the uh, math science, and uh, uh, more specifically, also he is the winner of the the Kunus Prize, like a very very important prize in uh, computer science in general. And he's uh, in all these national econ. Um, uh, national uh, academies. We will talk about that actually, also the environment, other things. He may give some insight about this national academies and he is the fellow of the ACM. Uh, with this start, I think we can uh, talk about uh, like a uh, start uh, talking and uh, do you want to say any starting word? Uh, hello, Mohammed. It's um, nice to be in your program. Uh, um, well, we'll see how this goes. I haven't done this thing uh, before, and I don't know how your uh, meetings go, but we'll uh, improvise and hope that it's not, uh, it's a little bit interesting, maybe. I hope it's not too. <laughs> um, you know. Yeah, I'm sure that I mean the people will enjoy essentially to get a little bit knowing <laughs> you more and of course your work a bit uh, uh, more. Uh, great. By the way, here also I just wanted to I mean, uh, uh, like there are this uh, uh, things are going in Iran or in Ukraine. I want to I mean uh, mention I mean this is like the sad stories that happens in both countries, and I want to say the condolences to the people who have been killed during these things, especially some of the things that this government, like Russia or Iran's regime are doing. But uh, anyhow, with uh, that start, uh, let's uh, go a little bit and talk about the uh, time that you were a child. So uh, have you, I mean, what was the general idea uh, like that you had it about computer science or math? And you will, uh, you have been at uh, Greek at that time. So how was the, I think you are the first person from Greek, actually, <laughs> from Greece. And uh, so what are the, I mean, what you can want to say there? Did you have any idea that you want to go computer science or math? Yeah, tell uh, us more about that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, at the time when I was growing up, I mean, computers were not really household items, you know, like uh, uh, nowadays there was no personal computers, no cell phones. Nothing like that. Computers existed only in a few places. And uh, even in the university, there was just one computer which was uh, accessible. You know, you have to sign up to use it with punch cards at the time. So it's, uh, and certainly when I was in high school, the, uh, we, you would see computers only in the movies, you know, the, <laughs> so that's uh, my familiarity with them. So I had no idea about what computers are and what, you know, that there is a field computer science. So um, uh, when did you start? Uh, I think the highest school uh, the, for the university so uh, or the college. So you went... Uh, uh, at the Greece, you went to university, correct? Around 1970, I guess. Right, yeah. So I entered university in 1970, yeah. So I, I, in, um, 
I went to the what's called the Polytechnic, the, the uh, National Technical University of Athens. That's the Polytechnic School, the engineering school. So in, in this actually, it's uh, the different school. I mean, there are they are separate universities. So the Polytechnic, the engineering school is a separate university. Uh, you know, the economic school is a separate university. So the, and, uh, when you actually when you enter the university, you enter a particular department. You have to you give. I think it's still the same. You give a national wide examinations and you declare which department you want to study. So that's very unlike the American systems where you enter the university, you take some courses and then you decide the major. And uh, is it still the case? Yeah, I believe it's still the case. Yeah, you enter a particular department. So when you you take your exams, you you do you rank which department you want to go to. And then there is kind of a matchmaking that uh, decides which department each student uh, is, uh, you know, is able to attend. Uh, uh, but that is in advance of essentially entering the program, correct? In advance of entering the right the program. So you, you, as a high school in high school, you have to decide which department uh, yes. you're going to major in, which field you're going to major in. I think it is still the case, for example, in Iran or Korea. I know that it is still the case, probably several other things. I think in the US also it's somehow similar, but I mean, like for example, in one year they may come in the first year and then they choose which major they want to take. Yeah, or so something in, like the, in the US, you are admitted to the university, and then within the first or second year, depending on the rules, you have to declare a bachelor. Yes, right? that is good. The university. Not. So, Right now, for example, you know, people, you know, you have lots of students admit to the university and within the first year, a big chunk of them decide to do computer science. Uh, yeah, exactly so the same thing. There's no control about, you know, what the number is going to be. Uh, great, because I think that's actually, I thought that this is the issue for us because we are a public university. We have like at University of Maryland, and so we have more restrictions. But apparently, somehow, this is the case also at Columbia, that you don't have but that much control on the people yeah, who want to come. Yeah, that's how American universities work. Yeah, yeah. that's generally true, yeah. Uh, great. Yeah. So uh, then uh, you have done uh, So you have done more uh, uh, electrical engineering or math during your undergrad, which one? I did electrical engineering, right, yeah. So uh, at the time, there was no computer science department. And in fact, there was no, in Greece, there was, um, during my undergraduate, there was a simple course on computer science. There was only one course in computer science, which was basically programming a little bit about structure of the organization of computers, covering everything and programming. Uh, and uh, what about for math? So uh, have you had some interest uh, like on math itself? So which one was more <laughs> engineering part you liked or the math part that you liked, especially even in high school? Uh, yeah, so I, I like the math part. <laughs> the math part. I mean, <laughs> I, mean it's, uh, I, I liked physics also in the engineering part, but the, the, it's mainly mathematics. But uh, the way the things were in Greece at the time, and I, I, I think that's not only Greece, that's in many countries. And then, uh, at least in Greece at the time, it's that uh, sort of good math students would go into the engineering school. The uh, yeah, yeah because... so that actually, I remember that was the case also in Iran, that even some people with the math Olympiad background, they were going to electrical engineering or computer science. Uh, Maybe that's like the, I don't know, maybe more money was there or something like this. Well, so, I mean, there is, I think, many reasons. I mean, one is, first of all, uh, it was more difficult to enter. <laughs> so that means uh, that exactly. assigns more value to what uh, Exactly, is that is a... <laughs> There must be a reason that it's more difficult to uh, enter that university. But also it's driven mainly for professional reasons in that, when you finish, at least the perception was that you will get, there are more positions, you'll get better jobs. 
And in a sense, it's the same thing that's happened now with computer science. Many students go to computer science because when they finish, there is a lot of jobs, the salaries are better, and so there is, uh, you know, it's motivation to to grow that. Uh, great. So I think, uh, there is, I think in the States, uh, I mean, there is more people, uh, especially for undergraduates, students are more willing to just follow their uh, their desires rather than think of the job they're going to get afterwards. So that, you know, you see people still, you know, a lot of people still go to humanities and and art and so forth. It's, you know, where it's more difficult to make a living. Uh, yes, uh, uh, great. Uh, but anyway, we are, as I mentioned, we are uh, live, we are global, we are at uh, Twitter, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, and Facebook. If you have any question, please let us know, especially in Twitter or in LinkedIn and YouTube are good ones. So I'm checking them. We can answer I mean, some of them during the um, live. Uh, great. So let's go actually uh, uh, to now uh, you have finished your bachelor and then you are coming for PhD to Princeton. Uh, correct. So, uh, and I think around 90, 70, 74. Yeah, 75, 75 actually okay yeah. uh, great and i think that was interesting things also now i mentioned this you have lots of papers also with uh christos and i think christos was a bit ahead of you on the same country so did you know him before so and then uh, because he went to princeton also got his phd so yeah maybe you start yeah. talking a little bit about this and then your phd yeah, so we, uh, we didn't in um i didn't know him personally i mean i met him in princeton uh, he was uh, a few years ahead of me. He, we went to the same high school, actually, yeah. and the same university and the same department in the uh, in Greece, uh, the Polytechnic yeah. uh, Electrical Engineering. He was a few years behind me. Then, uh, when I went to Princeton, he was um, uh, we overlapped. So he was like a third year student, and I was a first year student. So that's that's where we met, and uh, that's when uh, we started, with, um, you know, collaborating and so forth. Yeah, so that's actually interesting. At that time, maybe I mean, now it was natural that you may contact him beforehand, but you know, there are emails. There were no emails or etc. At that time, that you want to contact. Uh, I mean, people. yeah. So, so, <laughs> so you're right. I didn't know. I mean, the uh, the people. I mean, if I knew I would contact him, I mean, like I, the year after me came, uh, you know, went to the States, I mean, for example, Paris Canelakis. So he contacted me, and he went to MIT. I don't know if you know Paris, you know. I see. He was, yeah. you know, he was in the same university a year after me. So he knew I was in the States. So he came to ask me about that, you know, sort of we met personally, but that's, before he came to the States to study. So, you know, if you, if you know somebody, you could ask them, you know, questions uh, about that. Now, Christos, I didn't know, actually, I met him uh, <laughs> in uh, in uh, Princeton. Uh, I saw him first when I arrived there. I saw this guy with a huge poncho and the hat. Yeah. He just came back from uh, vacation in uh, Guatemala, I think. Hey, who, so, who you are? You are talking about Christos, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we met there. Um, when I went to Princeton, actually, I went to start to in, uh, as I said, in the, in um, in Greece, we didn't have any computer science. It was just a single course. Yes. I learned how to program, uh, but that uh, was about it. Plus, I thought, you know, I was not the the. The class was not didn't really show you know the richness of the of the field. So what uh, I was interested in at the time was uh, electrical engineering communication theory. You know, so things like stochastic processes, continuous math, uh, this kind of thing. So I went to Princeton to study uh, communication theory, information theory. You know, this this kind of fields. But uh, Princeton was then electrical engineering. The department was together electrical engineering and computer science. So when I went there, you know, I I was assigned advisors in communication theory and electrical engineering. 
but uh, there was um, a Greek professor then uh, who was in computer science, so he suggested that I take some computer science courses. Courses. So I took some of the basic courses, and uh, you know that seemed very interesting. So that's a whole new world. Uh, so, uh, great. So, uh, uh, what about uh, Chris? Was he also in the same department, electrical engineering? So you were yes. uh, you went to electrical engineering at Princeton, correct? It's together. It's, uh, it was electrical engineering and computer science. Oh, I see. I see. Because now so, they are two different departments. But I think at that yeah, time, yeah, so, so they thing. split apart, right? A few years I see, later, I see. you know, Good. some years later, after I graduated, some years later. They created the computer science department. Yeah, or some, like, for example, I think Michigan, MIT, or Berkeley, still they are the same. They are yeah, the so same, but ECS is the same. They still have it uh, joined, right? Uh, uh, great. Okay. And uh, so at that time, uh, and I think your advisor was uh, Jeff Ullman, correct? So how did you start working with him? Actually, he recently got the Turing Award as well, but yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so, so as I said, when I went there, I was... Uh, I had a different advisor in electrical engineering. And uh, the first year I took uh, some computer science courses. So like an algorithms course and uh, automata theory course. So which Jeff Ullman taught the automata theory course. So that seemed to me fascinating. So after the first year, uh, I think uh, like in the break or uh, beginning of second year, I decided uh, to switch to computer science. And then I I went to Ullman that I, you know, asked him, uh, you know, I said, uh, I like, really like this automata theory. I like to uh, do computer science work on that. So I switched to computer science now. <laughs> Jeff Ullman told me at that point that automata theory is dead. You're gonna do something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can do computer science, but you're not gonna do automatic no, automata theory. theory. Yeah, that is yeah. like the uh, yeah. That's actually an interesting thing. I think we can talk about these uh, things that I mean, some areas that actually become dead at some point, and then may, some of them actually may be resurrected. Like for example, parallel computing. I think that was in like it was a bit down around 2000, and again. This is no, new okay, concept no, of MapReduce no. and Spark and others actually so, became to life. The same thing with automata theory. You know, it, uh, at that point, it was basically dying or was dead, but was resurrected again in the 90s with verification. Exactly. So that, uh, think that. Uh, you know, that, I mean, this is kind of a central tool in, you know, automated verification. So, so good ideas, you know, may go dormant for a time, but then they will come back. And then, you know, they are still yeah, I think, uh, Even I think about this kind of the uh, deep networks, that was like the thing that the people were thinking essentially before, and it was dormant in some sense, and then it gained somehow resurrected about, uh, especially with an, uh, NLP and natural language processing again, and now is a very hot topic. So these are All the right. ideas yeah. going up and down. I think that might be a good uh, advice for, yeah, I mean, when you want to do your PhD, sometimes you want to do the one that is the state of the art, which makes sense, actually. <laughs> the same way that, as you mentioned, the people may like more electrical engineering than math, for example, because I think there are maybe more opportunities or salary, etc. But at the same time, you know, if you are lucky, <laughs> then this area that might be it, it may come back again and become very strong uh, next time that it comes. So uh, that was... Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so uh, actually, and also this book, uh, I actually read this Hopcraft uh, uh, Ullman, I think, a book that I was reading when I was even not high school. I was in high school, actually. I was studying for informatics Olympiad, and that was one of the good books that I was reading. And several, some of them actually very nice, uh, as, uh, like exercises, and needs a lot of thinking about it. So uh, that's... Uh, Great. So you then uh, what did uh, you uh, study after Automata? So Automata was dead at that time, at least. Or you were thinking that is dead. What was the main yeah, uh, so, topic? So I, I got into um, uh, graph algorithms and approximation in particular, approximation algorithms. So uh, the, uh, the, um, you know, up to that point, my sort of the math I was used to from my undergraduates and communication theories 
continuous map probability theory and things like that. And but then uh, you know, in uh, when I got to know computer science, you know, it's the it's more the discrete side of it, the discrete math combinatorics. So uh, the which to me it seemed a lot of fun. <laughs> It didn't seem like serious math because it was more like puzzles, right? So, uh, for example, Christos was telling me about he was doing his thesis on the traveling salesman problem. Yeah. Uh, which uh, seemed fun, but it's, you know, I, you know, I would say, you know, this is not serious, you know, this is games that children can play, you know, what is this is a uh, kind of recreation mathematics as opposed to. Yes. <laughs> Serious mathematics, which yeah. it is, but of course, you know that is uh, that is actually what's attractive about it. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. the thing that you can actually express it. Uh, and I mean, like if you know working on algebraic uh, geometry, it is very hard to even describe. Like if you are working in math and algebraic geometry, it's very hard to describe to the regular people. But the traveling salesman, the problem that I mean, still we are working. I don't know. After 60, 70 years, and we have some progress, we are improving the approximation factor from, I don't know, three half to three half minus epsilon, and we are very <laughs> happy about it. So, uh, uh, and so uh, your, uh, uh, so for Christos, who was his advisor? Uh, Christos was working with Ken Stiglitz. His advisor was Ken Stiglitz. I see, I see. Yes. So, uh, and uh, did you had any uh, collaboration during that time? Because later you had lots of collaborations together as well. So, how did you start working yeah, together? Uh, yeah. So we 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 started talking, uh, you know, while he was a student, and then I think pretty soon, I do, probably. I don't think that year, the first year, I mean, year we wrote anything, but the following year we we started writing papers together. Yeah. So uh, pretty soon, like uh, the second year after I came to, you know, he moved on, he graduated, and uh, but then we 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 kept contact and we we started collaborating on papers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so then, when then, I switched also after I switched to computer science, so after my first year I switched to computer science. So then I started working on uh, this kind of problem. Yeah, so it was actually, I mean, thinking was one of the things that we are talking about, uh, I mean, like advisorship in some sense. So I see that actually you have very few papers with uh, uh, Jeff Ullman. So I think uh, like the, I think one of the first one was around the 79, five, uh, like uh, 79. So, uh, yeah. so how was the thing? So did you, I mean, what was the things there? Like the people were publishing a lot with their advisor at that time, or not? Well, it, it depends on uh, it depends on what uh, you know the subject and the relationship. I you know I started working when when I switched to computer science, started uh, with Ullman. He suggested to look at uh, approximation algorithms. algorithms. Uh, there was uh, there were individual results on approximation algorithms then. Uh, but uh, you know, not a coherent theory, not not much of a theory. Yes. So the the intention was to actually. So I started thinking about making a theory of approximation algorithms, and that's actually what the Jeff had um, thought would be a good topic, like analogous to np completeness, where you kind of tie the problems together and have some coherent theory. Yeah, actually, I mean, the, I think the Kunus Prize that you uh, received it, that was mainly because of this kind of making this more formal, essentially, about the approximation right, so, algorithm so. and the roots of, I think, PCP started. So PCP, like, uh, I think you have worked on the this idea of approximation before the general PCP theorem. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, since actually my graduates, my graduate studies, that's something I, I started thinking. So I kind of thought about some general things, but nothing, you know, interesting. I mean, uh, nothing interesting enough to write down, let's say. But uh, that's something I've been thinking over the years. And uh, uh, now what 
what happened when I was a student is that, uh, so I had some individual results, you know, on uh, simple results on uh, approximation. But uh, then, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I did some other work on, uh, on graph problems, which, uh, you know, then um, became my thesis. Well, actually I, I proved some results and then uh, Olman told me, okay, <laughs> you have proved enough to graduate. So oh. <laughs> I was not quite ready because I had just switched to computer science. This happened like uh, in my, you know, I, I was just uh, learning the field. So, yeah. so uh, but I think you joined 75 to Princeton and you got your PhD in 1978. It means that just three years you got your PhD there. Yeah, right? yeah, three years of which one year I was doing electrical engineering. Yeah, so, so that was <laughs> very so fast basically, actually. I to, uh, one year as computer scientist and then, you know, uh, Jeff told me, okay, you're, you're graduating. So at the time, actually, I was, um, I wanted to do the approximation part, you know, the, yes. the approximation theory. I wanted to resolve the click problem, for example, is a yes. problem I was thinking at that point. So. Uh, I told uh, Olman, you know, I, I'd like to stay, you know, a little bit, a bit more. more. <laughs> Let me just uh, resolve the click problem. So if you tell me you can't resolve it next year. <laughs> you know, okay. Maybe he had a good vision about so that. He had a good sense not to let me go on that path. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's actually interesting. So then, uh, so uh, like, you were not uh, his first PhD student, correct? Oh, no, 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 no. He, he had uh, uh, a number of students before that, you know, many, uh, you know, you know, distinguished students. Like Ravi Sethi was his first, first PhD student. I don't know if you know Ravi. Uh, uh, Ravi uh, what? what was the Ravi last? Sethi. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Ravi was his first PhD student. You know, they have done uh, classical work on... You know, register allocation. And, uh, yeah. Kind of, yeah. So, uh, yes. so, so that was it. Uh, so what he about had a lot of students. So, so actually, at that time, Jeff Ullman was switching to databases. Yeah. I was basically maybe his last student that was not doing databases. But the thesis was not on databases. Yes, I think your thesis was on the complexity of maximum subgraph problem. So right. I, yeah. yeah, these are like I believe it was lots of approximation algorithms that I couldn't see the online version. Well, well, it's uh, there is some approximation, but it's mostly on uh, uh, proving that uh, family, a whole family of problems is empty complete. Basically, see, all see. pretty much all maximum subgraph problems. Like if the property is inherited, then uh, every such problem is empty complete. So it's a general empty completeness result, basically, or a bunch uh, of general empty completeness results. Uh, great. So uh, th that's uh, interesting. So let me ask this actually, which is some of the other discussion that we have it about like PhD advising as well. So I think you graduated very fast. I think you mentioned that three years, one year you were in electrical engineering and just two years in PhD. So uh, the Two questions here. Uh, so was it the case also for other students of uh, Jeff Ullman? Was it common at that time? And actually, I mean, what is the current thing that you are thinking? Because this is also a question that I have it. And I have it with my students. I will discuss that. And I said that there are two ways. Either if you want to do actually do it a lot of, I mean, become a, go to academia and be a professor, then it makes sense. Actually, you will be there for several years. I don't know, maybe four or five years. If you want to go to industry, usually actually you can do it much faster and you can have a paper to go there and you are missing actually some time if you go later because and you have been in industry yeah. and especially nowadays, the start time is very important and in three years you may go two levels up essentially. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead. So I, I think uh, the most important is that it's different times now. At that time, you could finish quickly and, you know, uh, many students, Christos finished in three years. And, I see. You know, others. So it was feasible to finish quickly for various reasons. Number one, there was less to learn. The field was young. So there was <laughs> less to learn. I mean, it was easier to learn it fast. And number two, you know, the, the field was young. So there was... Uh, 
more things to do that were fresh more easily. You know, yeah. you didn't have to dig down deep. Exactly. To, you know, <laughs> learn a whole lot of things. So uh, things are different now. Now, uh, of course, students stay much longer. Also, you have to build, uh, you know, a resume with lots of papers. You know, exactly. I mean, to be competitive on the market, you need to, you know, to have a, have built a heavy resume. Yeah, actually, I mean, even you may need to go to postdoc even after four or five years and of PhD. Most students in theory go to postdocs. So in other yeah. fields, let's say in other area systems, etc., don't do postdocs. But in our fields, I mean, in the theory, yeah. So mo- most students start with a postdoc. So, <laughs> so, so it's a different, different situation nowadays. Yeah, but, but I think actually that's the case that also, I mean, for people, I mean, who want, I think that was the thing that I had with some students that discussed that, I mean, if you really want to go to industry and you like the industry, I still, I mean, they can possibly can have publish some papers and they can actually go to industry faster because as I mentioned, so especially if you want to do PhD, I don't know, five years, some five and a half, six years, and then two, three years postdoc, and then it is already eight, nine years that you have spent. So you can maybe do it faster in like two, three years, that three years that you mentioned. And then you have, I don't know, six more years that you can actually advance in industry. Yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend that. I mean, now I think it's, even if, I mean, first of all, it depends what kind of job you do in industry. If you go to a research lab, uh, I think it's uh, yes. uh, uh, then you need university. to do the same. You have to establish yeah. your uh, research credentials. Yes, exactly. Uh, but even if you don't go to a research lab, I mean, if you go to the development side, I think it's good to spend the extra year in, uh, you know, do, do a little bit more research, build uh, your resume because Okay, maybe you will not do research in the if you go on the development side of industry. Uh, but still, you know, you have a little more practice and the practice will be good, not not for writing papers, but will be good for thinking about problems, even develop, you know, that you meet in development, you know, how to abstract the problems, how to research what has been done, what uh, to do about it. So I think spending the extra year in graduate school is not bad, actually. I think it's going to be useful, even if you don't follow the research career. Uh, great. Yeah, actually, I will say one other reason that, uh, I mean, this, like when you go to these companies now, of course, there are lots of tech companies. I think the time that you were, we were talking about uh, Bell Labs, maybe there were more, like fewer companies, but now you will go and you will see the people are going there and some of them are, they go advance their career very fast. So it may be the case that I think the one that if you go to industry, it might be the case that even you may not do research yourself, some researcher may report to you even indirectly. So it is good to have some ideas about research to understand better these people who are reporting to you. And that's uh, one other reason that actually is good to have a good ideas about research, even if you don't do research yourself. Yeah, yeah. Plus in your career, I mean, the, the field is going to be moving. I mean, there yeah. will be new ideas will come in, new sub- new directions, new technologies. So you have to be educate yourself as time goes on. I mean, so you have to be able to read, understand what you are reading, get to know what's and to use your judgment, be able to have judgment as to what how things go. Of course, this is one type the experience we get in uh, doing research for a PhD is one type of experience. And there is lots of other experience you're gonna get into industry, which you don't, you are not exposed in the university. So this is, uh, you know, this is, does not cover really your education, the, you know, the university. There, there's other parts of the education which you're gonna get on the field. Uh, uh, great. So, uh, and, uh, so in general, about uh, I think we discussed about some difference between advising at that time versus now. So, are there some? Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, some kinds of uh, general tips that you are considering advising now, essentially, that might be helpful for young faculty as well, or you have done it essentially with your students. So, do, one other thing that I think we discuss with other guests that do you have close relation with uh, students or like the PhD students or you are just meeting them once and 
week or something, they talk about their reports, etc. Well, what is the style that you like? Uh, well, typically I meet the students uh, like once a week, like you said, and uh, we discuss, uh, you know, progress. Yeah, it depends, you know, it may be that uh, they, they work on a problem and they tell me how they are doing, or it may be that uh, we work jointly with the student and uh, maybe with other students and faculty, and we have regular meetings and bounce okay. ideas. So it depends on uh, the situation, the student, on the problem area. So it could be anywhere from just being a sounding board and feedback and you're giving uh, um, pointing directions uh, to the side of uh, just uh, having, so, uh, or, you know, doing research during the meetings, you know. Bouncing ideas and uh, you know uh, brainstorming, and it, uh, it doesn't have to be one to one. It could be also with uh, other students or other faculty. So it could be like a group of meetings. Uh, actually, so depending on the circumstances. Yeah. Uh, so was it the same style also that uh, Jeff Ullman was uh, like advising you? So uh, well, with with Jeff. Um, we wouldn't meet that regularly, I mean, at the time, because uh, I <laughs> basically, I would go away, think about it, write down what I thought, give it to him, and he, he would go very carefully. I mean, he was very thorough, you know, making comments on what I would write, yeah. give it back. And, uh, uh, you know, at the time, we didn't really work together in that sense. I see it. I mean, at later times, I worked together with him in the in the sense of working on the same problem together. Yeah, uh, but that was the, more, I think, essentially, you are papers. Yeah, but uh, uh, during my graduate studies, we didn't really work together on the yeah. problem. So it was uh, more commenting essentially on the right top, etc. Uh, yes, and uh, sort of giving me a uh, sort of. Uh, Give, giving uh, sort of his um, wisdom as to what you know, what direction to pursue, what would be interesting to do, and what would be not his perspective on what is uh, what would be a good direction to take it, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think also I wanted to connect uh, this one. Uh, I think actually that was one question that people asked as well. So this is a. Uh, so 1978 was, I think, if I remember correctly, that was the time that Gary Johnson book also is published. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, yeah. Shortly. Yeah. So uh, 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 and I think you had actually several papers with late David Johnson. I mean, of course, we were both at Bell Labs at that time at some part of the things. So, uh, uh, so did you know uh, David? Uh, and I mean, yeah, have so you been I aware of that? Yeah, I, I, I met them when I went to the labs, yeah. So I first then, uh, well, yeah, I met them when, uh, in 78. Uh, uh, I see. My Gary and Dave Johnson, yeah. And everybody else, you know, lots of other people were at the labs here at the time. Uh, and you joined the same lab, essentially. It was, uh, yeah. Well, in uh, the labs, there was, uh, uh, my Gary and David Johnson were on the, the there's something called the Mathematics Center. Yeah. And there was a computer science center. So I there see. were like a center you should think of as a department in the university. I mean, actually bigger than a department in university. But uh, sort of there was theoretical computer science going in the mathematics uh, center and in the computer science center. And there was a lot of interaction between the two. So they were in the same building and uh, there was a lot of interaction. Uh, could, sometimes you couldn't tell who was in which department. You know. So, 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 and so you have been at Bell Labs for a long time. I think maybe around twenty years or even more. Correct? Uh, at Bell Labs, yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, more than twenty years. I was there until uh, two thousand one. Basically, yeah. So yeah, that I think you went years. to Stanford for a year at that time, and then right. after that yeah. you moved to Colombia. I think we can't discuss that move as well. But uh, good. So after graduation, you went to Bella. So did you think about applying to like 
become a faculty someplace. But Bell Lab was one of the best places at that time to do research, actually. I right. don't know anything even equivalent of that, at, especially even that time or even later, because later I joined also that at and and that was actually, that was back in 2007, but it still was a very good place to do research. So yeah, so you want to tell us about a little bit the environment there and, if you have been in some other companies, how do you compare it with now with the other things like Facebook? Microsoft is still doing more things maybe, but maybe they, that even has been changed about the pure research to more applied stuff. And also other places like Facebook and others, yeah. Yeah, so, so at the time, uh, Bell Labs was a fantastic place. It was like a top department except times three, let's say. The number yeah. of researchers was uh, much more than you would get at the university. So uh, uh, I, I considered uh, academia actually, <laughs> uh, so I actually applied to, to, to some universities and I considered going there, uh, but I thought I'll go to the labs, stay there a few years, built up my it, uh, research portfolio, yeah. learn also some more, you know, educate myself a little more. And after two, three years, I will go to a university. But uh, <laughs> it turned out the environment was so good. <laughs> you have uh, been there 21 I'll years. Do it later, I'll do it later. Well, at some point I went back to Greece also for a short time to teach and came back. I see. Uh, but so I kept postponing going to university. So until then, it happened much later. Uh, but, so uh, at the time, you know, the uh, uh, apps, you know, had um, was very free willing. I mean, research was very open and creative. Lots of creative people in uh, both in the mathematics and computer science. So it was the time that uh, you know, on the computer science, you know, then uh, when they created, you know, they had just created Unix, they were, uh, uh, you know, C language, then the, you know, C++ language, you know, there was uh, things on the theory side, you know, there was uh, Alejo, was, uh, he was actually my manager at, uh, um, at my labs and many other, you know, you know, great people. And on the math side, Ron Graham, Gary Johnson, uh, you know, uh, Bob Tarjan came for several years, uh, uh, you know, Ed Kaufman, you know, many, many people. So there was a very fantastic environment. Plus you had, pretty much full-time research, accessibility to everybody. So, every, you know, all the doors were open. You could walk into anybody's office and bounce a problem, have a conversation. So the environment yeah. was just great. Yeah, I think that was... So, uh, like, uh, one question I think that the people have. So, uh, lots of these things, I think research, uh, like, very nice topics and nice advance happens during this time at Bell Labs. Lots of this thing, if you go to the roots of them, actually come from Bell Labs. So, uh, like, but here, I mean, you will see that nowadays there have been lots of these companies. It is much more like the uh, product driven that you need to have the product and you make essentially the revenue for the company. How was there? I mean, what was the difference there? So like I, like the source of money, I think it was coming from the telephone, etc. Was it the case that it was like somehow you could do research because the company was a stable and you could do, yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, uh, one difference was that at the time it was a monopoly, basically, the, exactly. for companies okay. sort of there was. So, um, so the, there was a lot more room on the financial side, which leaves room on the, you know, to trickle down, you know, research is a very small part of the whole operation. Exactly. So, and, uh, you know, it provides some useful service. I mean, you could consult with... Uh, uh, research if needed, you know, so there was some interaction between research and the products, you know, development, but, you know, not, not that much, I would say. I mean, there was still, 
there, so there, there was, it was useful to have a research organization, but uh, it was not, it was a small part of the whole company. Now, as uh, you got the, you know, the telephony world changed, as years were known, you know, they broke the companies into local, long distance. And then uh, later on in, um, in 96, they broke off the equipment part of, you know, AT&T from the service part. Exactly. So that's you know, when uh, Bell Labs was also split into the Bell Labs part that was with Lucent, which, which was the equipment and uh, services and, uh, uh, you know, the more technology related with the AT&T, which provided service, you know, long distance service. So yeah, the, uh, the uh, actually, you know, <laughs> a few times happened that, I mean, uh, company is broken down. I think for Bell Lab this happens, and I think because I was at at and that was one of these things. I, if I remember correctly, I think the whole company essentially maybe broken at the end, maybe to nine pieces or even more. And then interestingly, then these small pieces, they couldn't survive. Then they tried to essentially bought by the other companies. And again, at some point, these nine pieces that some kinds of like one company went to nine. And then again, lots of them actually came back to become the same company. At oh, some the point. local, right. When they, yeah. <laughs> that was happened in the 80s where the local companies you know, like uh, what is now Verizon and Bell South and Bell exactly. Pacific and so forth broke up and they created their own lab, which was called then Bell Bellcore. Yes, exactly. Concordia, right. So uh, there was a, a number of people that left the labs and went to Bellcore. But that was a relatively small number. Yeah, but I, I will uh, say that uh, it uh, was uh, a much bigger split between the labs and the Yeah, labs. But, 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 no, but I think that even some of these companies that they were broken later, they come and they bought each other and they yes. become one company right. again. So there, there's <laughs> the consolidation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and uh, I think that's interesting because there was even some discussion for Microsoft at that time. They want to break it down. It didn't happen for too many companies. I don't know whether it was the correct things to do or not. Because in some sense, I mean, if you have a correct environment, there are some new technologies that will come and the monopoly by itself cannot survive long time because there are new technologies coming. And like, for example, Microsoft, that happened. I mean, they wanted to have the, uh, they were late for Windows on mobile and they couldn't get anywhere essentially there, but they changed the course essentially. And I mean, they, for example, went to more like a game environment and others, they could survive. So in some sense, I'm not so sure. What do you think? Do you think that was a correct move to break Bell Labs? Uh, well, so for the, I mean, it's, I think uh, the, for uh, one thing is to break the companies, okay, the telecommunication yeah. companies. Yeah. So this is what is driving it. Now, uh, Bell Labs is a small part of uh, the Bell Labs, which is R&D, is, yeah. is a part of the bigger company. And the research part is an even smaller part of the R&D. Yes. So for uh, personally, as researchers, it was not, I mean, it was, uh, well, we didn't like the fact that our friends would go and split. Other you know, yeah. like, for example, with the, our colleagues that went to AT&T labs, you know, like David Johnson and his group, we would see them every day and work every day together and so forth. So yes. this was a bit of a hard, you know, separation for us on the personal level. But as for a societal level, that's a different issue, you know, breaking up the company. Sometimes, you know, you got to do that. You know, this is... Uh... Yeah, so you believe on that one. Because I think uh, that's a thing that I mentioned. I am saying that this is like <clears throat> the game theory part that we can, we will talk more about it. But this is like the idea that in game theory, there is, I mean, there are some kinds of, if the, it is the correct environment, competition itself essentially may kill monopoly at some point. Uh, that is like, it can be <laughs> true or not, I don't know. But... Yeah, so... Uh, well, I mean, it's, it is, it's a, you know, competition, uh, you you have a little bit, then you shift a little bit, you know, shift attention more to the short range by necessity, because you have to, you know, every company has to, 
um, satisfy so, their you know their next quarter and the next quarter. So exactly. it gives a less of a breathing room to do long range planning. So this is kind of the trade off you 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 have, but uh, you know sometimes you know big organizations can become you know uh, ossified and you know slow moving and bureaucratic exactly. and all of these things. Yeah, and, and that's exactly the thing that I mentioned that that actually can kill a monopoly because if there is I think the competition itself is something is like a healthy one that a company cannot be monopoly because all of this then becomes very big. And I think that was somehow the reason that they mentioned Microsoft, that like they were good, at, they were essentially like a perfect place, but then when they, all this kind of cell phone, et cetera, are coming, they were late in the game and they lost essentially the operating system of the cell phones. And they needed to catch up later with the other things, like for example, go to the game business, et cetera, or like Xbox, other stuff, essentially. That was the one that, could revive yeah, yeah. them essentially. Otherwise, it was how they were like a very good position actually at that time. Or IBM, the same thing. It was like a very good place. I think nowadays, is, I mean, it's a reasonable place, but it's not at that uh, uh, like place that he was there maybe, I don't know, 20, 22 yeah. years ago. Yeah. But uh, uh, anyhow, so let's uh, uh, go to some of the other things. So I think that uh, for the like uh, some a little bit more researchy part, so uh, I think you got the uh, Kunos Prize. One was this uh, Max SNP. I think this is like Apex Hardness, essentially, if I remember correctly. As well as, I mean, the, somehow funding the, this PCP, especially this paper that you had it with. Uh, this is the London Yanakakis. I was actually reading it at uh, like, the time that I was PhD students and later. It's uh, like a very famous paper. Uh, that is, and also the coloring problem, I think. Uh, so... Maybe, I mean, uh, you were talking about Kilik. I think you solved maybe two uh, very important problems in the same range, also like coloring and set cover. Yeah, you want to talk a little bit about, I mean, this work and how yeah. did you get there essentially? Somehow, continuation of your <laughs> thesis, I can see, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, the picture, uh, I mean, now, the, now we have a clear picture of well, relatively clear picture of what's going on with approximation. At the time, the picture was that uh, basically all problems were pretty much open in the sense that we were taking the basic graph problems. Let's say the, for example, the click problem. Okay, we, for all we knew, could be that there is a uh, polynomial time algorithm that uh, approximates arbitrarily well. Okay. Or it could be that everything was impossible. You couldn't approximate to a constant factor. You couldn't approximate to a log factor to and to the power factor. Okay. So uh, we didn't know. And I mean, we knew that if you could do some constant factor you could do arbitrarily well. So there was some small reduction, but the whole range was open. Coloring, pretty much the same picture. We didn't know <laughs> if you could do very, very well or had to be very, very badly. Um, the, you know, many problems. So for some, we had constant, let's say the traveling salesman problem. We had the Christophidis three halves algorithm, but we and here, know... but uh, sorry, just uh, just defining maybe this one traveling salesman problem that you want to go through all the vertices in the graph and visit them once, and you want to have the minimum total tourist links. Length, right? So there are lengths of the edges. You want to have the minimum total length. Uh, so we knew that you could get within three halves of the optimum. Uh, but uh, could be that there is an algorithm that does, you know, one percent, point one percent over optimum. Exactly. Could be arbitrarily close to the optimum. So, uh, you know, it was very open, and that's the situation with uh, you know set cover. There was an easy greedy algorithm which does a log factor. You know, set cover. You want to cover. Um, have a family of sets, you want to find a minimum uh, subset of, you know, subfamily of sets that cover everybody. 
with lots of applications in practice. Yeah. With lots of applications in practice, lots actually. Applications in practice. So there is a uh, trivial greedy algorithm which does a logarithmic factor, but we didn't know that you whether you could do, for example, uh, get a constant factor or even an arbitrarily good constant factor. Uh, vertex cover, you know, same. You know, we had a yes. factor two. Uh, and so I wouldn't know if you can do arbitrarily well. So there, everything was pretty much, not everything, but lots and lots of the basic problems were open. Uh, great. And so the, so the intention, I mean, uh, you know, I would like, you would like to have an empty completeness theory that kind of ties everything together. That's, uh, so that's, Basically, empty completeness was the situation where you had all these problems. We didn't have good algorithms, right? Uh, there were exponential algorithms, the TSP and so forth. And the empty completeness theory tied them all together and said they are basically the same problem. The if same you get problem. polynomial time for one, you can get for everybody. Uh, so th this is what you know we would like to do. We couldn't, um, and there was for many years no progress. So the, the, the idea was to, I mean, a common denominator for the empty completeness is satisfiability. Exactly. So the, there is the corresponding problem for maximum satisfiability, where you don't ask to satisfy all the clauses, you want the maximum yes. number of clauses. So that problem, to me, it looked easier. I mean, it's easy to get, for example, uh, three sat, it's easy to get seven eighths. Yes. Uh, um, if it is everybody has three clauses or one. Uh, but even arbitrarily, you know, you can get, if it's a mixture of clauses, you can get something better. You know, you cannot get seven eighths, but you can get a half with your eyes closed. Yes. Uh, Just do some random assignments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that seemed to me like an easier problem, like it should be possible to get a arbitrary clear. Well on that problem. Uh, and um, sort of, I, yeah, I worked on that for a while. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't get, uh, you know, pitas on that. So after uh, a while, uh, so after some years, I thought, you know, that looks hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so at the time also, you know, Christos was coming to Belaps, uh, you know, every year we would bounce, we would work on various problems and we would always bounce around, I mean, I would bring up the approximability, you know, and three sat. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, so we would argue about whether that should be a hard or an easy problem. And uh, so eventually we decided, okay, let's say that it's a hard problem. What happens then? So that's you know we we we, we came up you know this I wrote this paper you define the class of problems this max S and P class so you can fix several problems there but um, and the notion being that the the implication is that if max maximum satisfiability is hard then you could spread the hardness to all these other problems. Other problems. So that's so that was the idea of that paper. So uh, I believe, so then uh, I think the PCP, uh, so uh, like uh, what was the distinguishing, because the PCP formally, I mean, was introduced later. So what was the things that uh, PCP could do that, I mean, at that time, I think some of this, your work, you could, because that was essentially one of the main reasons for PCP is to say that this kind of, uh, Pita says that these are one plus epsilon approximation. That is not possible. So, uh, yeah, so what was the advantage of PCP respect to, I mean, the work that you have done? Uh, it's not an advantage. It kind of uh, the PCP showed that you know, let's say that the, this conjecture basically is true that maximum satisfiability <laughs> you cannot do uh, unless uh, p is equal to n p. Unless p equals n p, but this is I of see, course, see. p equals n p. Everything is easy. Yes. Uh, great. Uh, right, I see. So, so this is basically the the crux, you know, that um, uh, satisfiability, maximum satisfiability is difficult. 
and uh, this this uh, then you know kind of and they developed a lot of of technology which you can use to solve these problems that <coughs> we showed hard but uh, even more you know can do a lot more you know I and then get more a little more uh, yeah so there was no i mean proof before pcp essentially can do that in some sense that was the open problem that was there can be this conjecture can be solved or not essentially and that they could solve it and uh, what about for the set cover uh, i i think uh, i remember the thing that you had in the paper but was it also dependent on pcp <clears throat> yeah yes yeah it uses pcp yeah uh, so, right. so uses this, uh, but uh, like uh, so, so the immediate implication let's say for set cover of of the pcp is that you cannot do a p tax uh, yes uh, I mean that's uh, and then you uh, amplify to you get can have sort of um, bootstrap it to show that you cannot do basically better than greedy essentially. <laughs> and was it and that was the... so, so, yeah, sharpened to exactly like greedy by, later by time? Yeah. Uh, uh, was it uh, uh, so the PCP was proved at that time, the time that you had the set cover, or still you were using the conjecture? No, no, it was proved. So, it was so, proved. So the so the PCP theorem was proved. You get uh, an approximability for um, uh, all, you do, cannot get PITAS. And so there was a paper about click before by you know which was just slightly before PCP, which yes. showed that you can actually leverage that to get much stronger in approximability. Actually, we kind of new part of it, but that leverage too much more. So as part of the PCP, it, it, uh, an implication was not only can you get PITAS, but you cannot get them to the some power. Exactly. Uh, so the, so in that, and this were, uh, so, so then we, you know, shortly thereafter, you know, Karsten and the I did the work on the coloring and the set cover, basically looking also at minimization problems because some of these are maximization problems. You know, max sat and the PCP is always about maximization problems. You can turn it to minimization problems, yes. but that sort of you have to do something to turn it to minimization. Yeah, exactly. Problems. I mean, this is the one of the things that I, uh, but actually, lots of this cover, I think we have, I don't know, you may have heard that we have this uh, new book uh, with. Uh, Eric Dimain and Bill Gassarch, that is about uh, this kind of, uh, I think we call it a, a, a computational interactability, a new guide to algorithmic or bonds. Actually, we cover, I mean, mention all of this uh, approximation in addition of MP hardness and several other things. So these are some of the things that, this is the, my favorite course that I'm teaching also, the same course I'm teaching for several years. And uh, this is exactly this type of maximization and minimization that you mentioned. I will mention because if the people are not aware, like if you are working, at, uh, I don't know, in just maybe this type of deep nets, et cetera, maximization and minimization, not much difference because you can put it minus, or even if you don't want to put it minus, you can, make a big number minus something. And so in that sense, these are the same set of problems. But really the catch is that when you talk about maximization problems, especially for the not MP hardness, the MP hardness almost the same, maximization and minimization. You can do this minus things. But for approximation algorithms, you cannot really do that. And the question is that whether this problem is naturally in minimization problem or naturally the maximization problem. And then we have a quite a different vision about the hardness of these problems maximization versus minimization, especially in approximation. These are quite different set of problems. Right, yeah. So, so it depends on where you are using it. I mean, the notion of approximation is this relative notion of approximation, really yes. how much percent you are off from the optimal. So it's a relative approximation. So it depends what your natural measure that uh, you are measuring, for example, if you want to spend the least amount of money, you are interested in the, it's the amount of money you're spending. So if you're spending 10% more or 20% more than the minimum, then the minimize, right? You want to minimize the cost. If you are making, you know, your problem is I'm uh, maximizing my income, you know, like your salary, you know, if you're measuring what percent more are you making is your race this year 
Yeah. So it's it's you you are measuring. It depends what's natural to measure for the particular problem. Yes, but I think that also has some effect. Like uh, in terms, like this is a different set of hardness results for approximation that we know for maximization versus minimizations. Like set cover, I think this is a one natural problem for. Um, if you want to get log n approximation for the problem, set cover is a very natural problem, uh, which is a minimization problem. So the, from the maximization side, I think there were no results until, I mean, I think we had, there were two results. One was about the domatic number. The other one was this natural problem. Actually, we had it about the unique coverage that you want the same input of set cover. You have a set of sets and, and you want to just select some of them such that you maximize the number of uniquely covered elements. But uniquely means exactly in, uh, included in one of them. Exactly one, like not more than one. This problem actually turns out to be, and there are some other works that after our work that shows that actually this is a very natural problem that is log n hard for maximization problems. Uh, not too many problems are known essentially for maximization problems that are log n or log log n, or these are the things that are known for minimization problems. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, you mean for the particular approximation ratio? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But the, the same problem, in a sense, the same problem or similar problems sometimes appears. Like, let's say, if you think of the click problem or the maximum independent set problem, yeah. it's a natural problem on its own right. For example, maximum yes. independent set. You have, uh, you know whatever, maybe tasks and conflicts, and you want to pick the maximum number of conflict-free tasks let's say, to process them. That's a natural problem. If you view the minimization version, that's the vertex cover problem. It's the flip side of the independent maximum. Independent set yes. is the minimum vertex cover. It can arise but, you know, naturally on its own. You know, you want to put, you know, pick a number of vertices, sort of whatever, to guard all the edges or to cover all the edges or the facilities or whatever it helps you. So that's, you know, depends on where it came from. The minimization version may be the natural or the maximization version may be natural and they may behave very differently. Like vertex cover, you can get factor two. And uh, it's better behaved than the maximization problem. Or... Exactly, that's the, the thing. So, uh, so was there any pro problem that could conditionally prove to be like condition on the fact that uh, this SAT essentially is hard to approximate? So, was there any result that was proved uh, before actually this PCP theorem is proved formally? Uh, not for these problems. I mean, there were. A lot of in approximability results. There uh, were uh, uh, yeah. uh, before PCP is formally proved. Yes, there were lots of in approximability results. Um, I mean, I, you know, by various people in my thesis, I had some in approximability, even end to the one minus epsilon in approximability for some problems. Yeah, I see. I see. So, so, that's so what... there is, you can prove results without needing, without the PCP, you know, strong in approximability. Certainly. But some, of, but for some, of, many of these core problems, you do need the PCP for to get the things yeah. or boosting it to get the best yeah. results. Yeah. Uh, great. Okay, so I think uh, let's go to the database. This is another thing that actually uh, you contributed a lot and the verification. Are these somehow? Uh, and I think at that time also you were at Bell Labs. So first, I mean, you get involved into databases because you were part of the company, or of course your advisor. I mean, Jeff Oldman also went to databases, or so. And, yeah. yeah. So, so I got involved because of the of uh, the fact that uh, Jeff Oldman moved to databases. So I see. I see. So cool. the you know the students were uh, you know working on that. I was talking with the students and uh, with. Uh, Ullman, so so that, that's how I got involved, and um, and that's you know then okay at the labs there was a there was not much in the, I mean there were some activities in databases but they were in a separate group so it was mostly working with the um, with uh, you know the my fellow students and uh, Jeff Ullman that I got involved in that. 
And that was kind of, a, it was a time where the theory of databases was being built. So there was new, uh, new things happening. The conference started, you know, there was the, uh, there's this conference on, on, I mean, there is the regular SIGMOD conference, which existed, where some theory papers were being published, but then, uh, you know, a whole uh, new conference on theory of databases started the principles of database conference. A POTS conference. A POTS, right. That started in uh, 81 or 82, I think. And it was a follow-up to uh, two workshops which were called XP workshops, which is the P stands for Princeton. Basically, it was see. organized by Jeff and the students, which were the you know workshop to do, discuss theory. I mean, the participants were not just Princeton students; it was also you know IBM, you know people from IBM, from universities, and uh, so forth, including Maryland. Yeah. Good. <laughs> right. So, but they were kind of small workshops, and then this the next year was with you know people thought, okay, let's make a conference. You know, it's time to have a theory conference on databases. So that's how POTS started then. And uh, that's nice that you an outlet that. for. Uh, and uh, when you have a conference, that generates actually more people working on this and uh, getting involved in that. And so you want to t tell us a little bit about this uh, work that you have done it on the, I mean, this uh, about uh, acyclic databases, uh, non-two-phase locking? Yeah, yeah. So these are um, different things. Uh, the, the acyclic databases is kind of a structure, different, uh, refers on the structure of a uh, uh, of the how you organize the data, you know, yeah. into relations. Yes. You know, every relation covers a relation between some attributes, some features. Yes. I right? mean, essentially, and, you can consider it as a table. I mean, if you want to consider it like in the, this Excel board, you can consider a table, and each of its relation is something, each row of this table. Yeah, so, and, uh, you know, every, there is columns which represent different attributes. Yes. Right, so, may, so you may want to talk about uh, whatever, for example, when you do your grade book, you may want to talk about the students, the grades, you know, and uh, some other information. Name, family yeah. name, is yeah. it? Whatever, yeah. So you'll have several of these tables and then... Um, <coughs> uh, <coughs> Um, <clears throat> so you have to combine information <clears throat> from the different tables to answer queries. And, um, you know, some, um, so, the, the, so there is structure of queries which combine different tables. So for some types, some organizations have some nice properties. And uh, basically this acyclic notion of acyclic is um, uh, refers to the structure of this table. So you view this uh, organization as a hypergraph yes. where the nodes of the hypergraph are the attributes on the, and the hyper edges are the different uh, tables. You know, different table, tables, yeah. about a combination of attributes, the other combination of attributes and so forth. Yeah. So a cyclic is a property of the hypergraphs of the yeah. structure of the tables, which has a number of nice properties. I see, I see, I see. And uh, <clears throat> kind of it arises naturally. I mean, it's uh, it's a nice thing to have, but also it kind of arises naturally when you organize your data. And the same thing when you apply it to queries, when you have queries which combine information, if you can view the query as a hypergraph. If it has this acyclic structure, then it makes processing easier. So problems that are uh, NP-hard, you know, or to take exponential time, 
become polynomial time if you have this acyclic structure. Yeah. So uh, essentially say if you have two separate databases and if you make some join, so you may do it some join in them, so you may create another database. So I think by a set of this joint operation, you may create actually a cyclic database. Am I right? Uh, no, not necessarily. It depends on how they, they, uh, they interact, how they overlap with each other. I see, I see. You know the what is the you know the, what is the attributes that connect with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, uh, so it's it's, uh, it's it's like graph cyclicity, but it's a little more general because it's hypergraphs. Uh, it's, it, so there is a, a there is an underlying tree structure. I mean, it's. Uh, but it's not, to, I mean, when you draw it, it may not look exactly like a tree. I see, I see. Because there is the set structure, because the containments also matter. Uh, good. So uh, that's, and, and as you mentioned, we can do some algorithms or some of these operations much more efficiently if it is a, a cyclic one. Correct? That yeah, was the. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, that's actually so, nice. Yeah. So, and they, and they have, um, and, you know, the structures have also some nice semantic properties in terms of which data depends on which data. So, and then if you have this kind of dependencies are kind of controlled, then it's easier to, you know, if you update one part separately from another part, let's say. So, it has several, you know, nice semantic properties yeah. as, if you have that. Yeah. Actually, this semester I was teaching principles of data science, and this was part of the thing that I and I have done. I mean, some of my in my own work also. I mean, uh, more practical stuff about working with database, relational database, etc. So these are actually quite uh, uh, nice stuff for the people who are interested in. So uh, then, uh, what about this uh, non-two-phase locking? So is it related to? No, no, it's uh, separate. So, so. One part of databases, you know, is the structure of the data, you know, schema design and uh, query processing and so forth. Another part, this locking has to do with controlling concurrency. You know, when you have several transactions running from the same database, you have to kind of protect the data so the transactions don't run on top of each other. So they don't create inconsistent data, you know, or, you know, create dirty data and leave the database in a bad state. Uh, so, for so example, the, uh, of two transactions trying to simultaneously access, you know, account on a, on a, you know, in the bank, you don't want the, you know, you know, to interleave the steps of adding and subtracting from the account. And then having uh, two times the withdrawal. Or, uh, 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 I think yes, if I remember correctly, these are some kind of a standard. It is called acid things nowadays. Right. So you have to want to it to behave as if every transaction runs after the on its own, one after the other, so that everything uh, looks consistent. But in reality, you want to allow them to run concurrently, but as long as they don't step on each other toes. Yeah, uh, uh, I think even uh, this, I forgot this theorem, I think that was in the uh, database theory that you cannot have, uh, I think the consistency and uh, like being uh, parallel, I forgot. There was some theorem that you cannot have all three of them together. I think uh, consistency and uh, at the same time accessibility, and one thing, and doing something in parallel. So this, I think that was a problem. Uh, I think a theorem that mm -hmm. I think Nancy Lynch and uh, so one of his students. About, yeah, so that's something. Yeah, that's about um, distributed uh, access, that consensus problem, and things like yeah, that. Exactly. Uh, you know, that's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, so that's another issue of the distributed. But even in a centralized database, you have the what I'm saying the. You you may run several transactions together in a, even apart from the distributed processing problem. Yeah, both from this. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, so that's that, like right, that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you have some mechanism that you 
you have to enforce serial serializability, what's called serializability, to appear as if the transactions run in a serial fashion, even though they do not. You know, so uh, uh, so the, there is usually some mechanism, and uh, you know, a simple mechanism is the two, uh, which is basically what is used to do commonly two phase locking. You know, that you lock things at the beginning and you unlock them at the end. I see it. That's the two phase that you are talking like. about. Now, uh, you know, there is some situations where you can uh, sort of uh, cannot do not have to do two phase locking. Health can sort of uh, allow violation of that and still be okay. So, for example, if you have a, a accessing a tree, several transactions access a tree, you can let them walk behind each other on the tree without locking the whole tree. I see, I see, I see. So, so you can uh, you can have sort of things where you don't do the two-phase locking and you are still correct. Uh, are uh, any of them are currently in practice in any of these uh, things? Are you uh, aware of them? Uh, I think it's mostly, I mean, in typical database, it will be just black box use. No, uh, it will be like to face locking, and you know, it will be that's what you'll use. Now, for special special kind of access, you may have sort of hand, you know, handcrafted basically or sort of special uh, things. But in general, I think the general mechanisms are uh, are the stand, standard mechanisms are used. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, so uh, um, good, and uh, so this is I think this kind of thing is very similar to the verification. The other thing that you have worked on it. So are they quite the verification work? Is it like somehow related, or that's also different? Uh, no, it? it's different field. I mean, uh, so uh, verification is you want to ensure correctness of. I mean, okay, this is also correctness. This is a bit correct, yeah. but this is more in the. Design. The other is, you know, correctness of protocols you know, or for uh, programs, hardware, things like that. So there's this whole field of verification. And yeah, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your edit. work there? Yeah, so there is the field that has grown of computer aided verification, so of automated verification. That's yes. a big it's a big field. It's uh, yeah. I mean in the early days, you know, there was uh, it was kind of hand verification in a sense, sort of people, yeah. you know, they, there were methods, people who were, you know, had methods for how to do manual, you know, assertions and in the programs, et cetera, to verify. Uh, you know, the idea of doing the, rather trying to do automated verification, computer edit verification that grew I would say starting in the 80s and then a lot more from 90 on. Mm -hmm. So that it's uh, you know a big field now with its own conferences and uh, um, you know tools, very advanced you know tools that do a lot of uh, you know get a lot of success and uh, you know both in the hardware initially but also now in the software world as well you know sort of to verify automatically uh, protocols device drivers you know programs and so forth so um so the idea there is to i mean you you know we know from theory that you cannot uh verify arbitrary programs you write the First, undecidability results were the halting problem, right? I mean, what's the halting problem? I give you a program, does it terminate? Okay, what's more basic verification? If you want to know that your program terminates, maybe, maybe it's undecidable. So there's undecidability yeah. results that you know you cannot do. You, you have to, you know, put realistic goals. You, know, you cannot for that. Otherwise, you, cannot. you think about. But uh, you know, uh, there is many things you can do. So the, uh, there is this um, basically area, area called model checking, where you have like a model of what you are um, trying to verify. You know, so it's you can think of it as an abstraction of your 
piece of hardware or of your program. And uh, you know, you can talk about properties you are trying to verify. So you write your properties in some kind of logic. And then, uh, you know, this model checking is basically to check your model against the properties, you know, so if it holds the properties. Now, depends how general your model is. So the, for uh, the model, one sort of basic model is a finite state model. model. So that's where one place where automata came back, come back to life. Actually, finite state models are uh, quite widespread. So let's say in, um, I mean, in, uh, for example, at Belaps, where I was in the telephony, I mean, people use finite state models for the telephony to, to model features in uh, various features of the, you know, the system, you know, uh, these are basically represented as finite state models. So uh, coming back to that, even automata theory as that, it, it creates a basis, but just the language of, you know, as an expression mechanism, finite states are pretty basic. When you want yeah. to describe uh, behaviors, you know, over time of a system, you know, the most natural is to have this, what's the state of the system and how does the system change state from state to state? How does it transition? That's basically a state model. And, uh, you know, you can have a finite state would be the simplest model. And people have been considering, I mean, uh, the, the basic model in the model checking is finite state, but then people have been considering also classes of infinite state models which are described in a finite way. For example, <clears throat> a piece of hardware you can think of as a finite state model it would be a very big finite state. And it may be as a, described implicitly as a product of, you know, of different components. Uh, so, so people have been done doing a lot of work, both theoretical and practical and tools how to verify, check big models for various basic properties. Termination is the simplest reachability, is the simplest property, but you know you want to do more basic things like uh, things like whenever you send a message, you want it to be received. You know, uh, you know it's, it's a simple property or you don't want to go into, you may have some safety properties that you want to stay within some region where some correctness property holds and not venture into incorrect state. So there is a um, lot of algorithmic work, theoretical work in terms of, uh, you know, developing um, models to uh, Take care of time, for example, timing uh, requirements, time, you know, timers or, uh, you know, components which are discrete components, which are continuous, you know, aspects that are continuous. So there is, it's a very broad field. Yeah. yeah. So, and, I mean, nice, how come, nice, you know, lots of nice work, both theoretical and practical. Not and, by, uh, by yeah. lots of people, no, not me. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, how come then you came to this world? I mean, to this, this was because of application in Bell Labs, or again that was. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was more because of um, uh, application in Bell Labs. So we had people actually doing work in this field, and some of the prominent tools actually were uh, at the time were from researchers at Bell Labs. So there is a. Uh, um, an early tool for hardware verification called COSPAN was created by Bob Kursen at the uh, Bell Labs. Um, who was, uh, so Bob was a mathematician in the math center, created this tool, to, you know, and the theory. And um, uh, the, then uh, the, on the software side, there was, uh, was uh, Gerard Holtzman created a tool called SPIN, which is kind of, prominent tool uh, for um, uh, verification of communication protocols and software, you know, so which is so uh, 
they have received so for example Gerard has gotten the software system awards and um, both Bob and so Gerard have gotten the kind of like award uh, you know sort of these are this well are prominent uh, systems uh, unfortunately well, eh, 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 have you been involved in some of them I think you you had some yeah, so, so, I, so I was yeah so I've uh, but yeah, so I was talking uh, with them and doing, you know, involved in the theoretical work and, you know, following the developments and uh, um, and contributing to some uh, algorithms and uh, theory uh, on, uh, <clears throat> you know, from uh, on this effort. And uh, we at the labs we grew the group and finally sort of sort of I was running a group which included both the theory and at some point also the verification components. Um, well, part of the department that I was running. Uh, so, so this was uh, at the time you know the, I think you know we had a fantastic group in doing verification. Uh, you know with Gerard Bob and. Various, you know, other people don't tell like, you know, so some uh, really very strong people in the field. Uh, mm -hmm. Good. So uh, actually, let me ask you, this is like personal thing. So you have been like maybe 21 years at Bell Labs and then, then like now I think it's around 21 years also at Academia. So which one you enjoyed more essentially? Is <laughs> that the Academia or, of course, there are some aspects. But... Oh, I, I enjoy all of that. I mean, uh, for example, so, I mean, that's uh, industry uh, at Bell Labs. There was the, first of all, the, rich environment with all, you know, mathematicians, physicists, uh, computer scientists, all in close proximity and, uh, you know, being able to interact every day. But there was also, a, you know, a source of problems in a sense of, you know, I mean, sometimes you can't do very much on the problem. Sometimes you can do, you can do something like, uh, so besides verification, another we got involved there was in testing, which is like verification, but testing is more you design test cases to test a finished system where you don't really know the design. It's more like black box testing. Yes. So, uh, so, so, so this, you know, that can be the source of sort of good, I mean, interesting theoretical work and potentially, you know, relevant, useful work. So that's, um, so, uh, you know, it's in, the, in the three, you know, that had the good aspect that you could get some sort of problem. Of course, you can have also the overhead that many times uh, there is problems that are there that are just theory doesn't really, it's hard for theory to help. Yes, exactly. Um, and you may, you know, sit in meetings where you see what people have to struggle with or Sometimes the most useful thing to do is define the problem. I mean, sort of exactly. a clear uh, definition yeah. of what is the basic concepts, what are you trying to do? And then maybe it doesn't take, you know, any new theory, any new algorithms. It's just understanding what, having precise definitions of what is the requirements, what is the goal, uh, you know, sometimes that's- Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing with the, the practitioner that, I mean, actually that we had similar things at at and that we were meeting long, I mean, several, like, I don't know, for a long time to just formally, I mean, define the problem because whenever we come with some definition, then some practitioner say, oh, we need to have one more kind of strength. And that means changing the whole program, essentially formulations and some result yeah. that you had it for the previous version does not apply for this because the theory, as you mentioned, is not as strong. If you want to do some of these genetics algorithms or other, that might be easy. Okay, one constraint, add one constraint to the program, it works. But for theory, that may change the whole problem, essentially, from an easy problem to a very hard problem, actually. Yes, yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, some in some things, uh, some things, you know, it's a matter of doing good engineering. I mean, it's, you know, uh, but I think theory has, can contribute the abstraction, I mean, the concepts, just defining what is the problem, I mean, defining what is the constraints. And when you spell it out, then you may discover that, oh, yes, there is this other constraint also. Yeah. But until you spell it out, it's all fuzzy. 
<laughs> so I think one benefit that you had it, I think, uh, I mean, yes, I think this type of thing is a typical company. Even nowadays, you need to go to lots of meetings. But at the same time, I think the Bell Labs in the sense that it was very in terms of research environment because of maybe monopoly or other at least early on. I think you had this uh, benefit that you could work on different set of problems. I think nowadays, if you want to be at industry, it's a bit more focused. You need to do in your work versus in academia, you can work almost in anything. I see, oh, I like this yeah. problem. I want to come back and work on it. That's a very good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, now, the, uh, I mean, from what I see in the research lab now, now is uh, more tied, uh, work is more tied to the work of the company, the product, which has its good sides also, because I think technology transfer works much better now in the Google and place, you know, and uh, places like that, where the research is closer tied to the products. So technology transfer was not that great at the labs. I mean, it was a at struggle. That. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, it was good for research. <laughs> it was good for research. But, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the, I would say sort of the main um, major effect was, there was some effect in the company, but not as much. I mean, the effect of the research was, I think, more at large. <laughs> I mean, in yeah, technology at large, rather than that for the company specifically. Yeah, that is yeah. like the uh, good. But I mean, one question we had, so have you done, I think especially you mentioned about C++, it was introduced at that time. Have you done programming at Bell Labs or later? Uh, you mean, uh, Right so program myself. Coding. Yeah, I, I, I did some. I mean, not very much, but uh, let's say when we were doing testing, I, I did write some programs. Yeah. Uh, good. Okay. <laughs> For <laughs> other testing. Yeah. But, but, but uh, not yeah. not that much. I mean, I, I if I needed to, I, I mean, there were other people who were much better at this. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. 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 I think so. And you have not tried, of course. I think now that you are a professor, I think like I think Python actually is a very nice language to know about it. As I mentioned, so I was teaching this. Uh, I was actually was starting. I mean, doing more programming. Uh, and Python is a good one. So that's the thing that I got familiar, and I had this course about principles of data science. But that is interesting. That I mean, Python is has changed a lot like from C++ and actually uh, even C++ nowadays has been changed because of Python. It, there are lots of things like a mapping and other, it is something mm -hmm. called STL that now you can do lots of these structures that are already there, like like something basic thing like linked list, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, heap, stack. I mean, these are some of the things that is already there. It was not like that before. And it's actually quite mm -hmm. different thing, even with C++ that got something like, some effects from Python, which is now, I think is more high level programming comparing to C++ and others. And uh, great. Now, uh, and I think uh, come back also to this area of research, game theory. So then how did you come into, I mean, the game theory, I can see it. I think you have done a lot of things on algorithm and especially about the local algorithm that if you do some kind of local movement, what will happen? And how many times do we reach in some kind of equilibrium? These are several work that you have done with Christos. So, uh, so, uh, that's one thing, and but also you had there were some elements of I think verification or testing. I will see also in their work. I think with Kusha et Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah. I mean, there is. Um, uh, the, I mean, there is some uh, game theory over there. I mean, you can view. Uh, there is. Uh, you can view the interact any interaction as a game. So in particular, yeah. let's say, for example, uh, when you are testing a system, you can view this that you are playing a game against the system. Against the system the is system. trying to hide its faults. You are trying to discover them. Exactly. When you have a system, uh, uh, even one system interacting with its environment, you can view that as a game where the environment is providing uh, you know, inputs. The system is reacting to the inputs. And that uh, you would like to discover what is the possibilities, you know, of the of this interaction, this behavior. Uh, so if you view it as a game, for example, you can view it as a you win. You know, the system wins if it gets to exactly. a bad place or whatever violates the constraint. Yeah. Or if you have several components, then you can view it as a game between different components. 
So any kind of interaction, you can, you know, view this as a game, either as a, you know, competitive game where, you know, there is a winner and a loser, uh, or, you know, maybe not, not a competitive game. I mean, uh, each one is doing their own thing. Yes. So that's, uh, so th this language comes in, in there also, you know, this um, view. So, so you can phrase them as game, also even as one player games, you know, mark of decision process, for yes. example, decision processes, especially if there is some probability in there also, where you're, uh, um, uh, so a mark of decision process is basically you have one player and you have randomness. Yes. And the one player is trying to optimize some objective. Like, uh, minimize so in some sense, you are playing with the nature in that sense. You are playing with nature, right? With yeah. with uh, noise, with randomness, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so I think that that's actually a very good view. When I was, I, I'm actually teaching an undergrad course also in the computational game theory, and that's the thing that I mentioned to students. That I think I, I felt actually quite <laughs> useful for them. So that before, like if you do games and you do computation, then you will see. I mean, at some point, that the whole world is a game. So sometimes, as you mentioned, these are competitive games. Some, I mean, like or more generally some of them are like this kind of coalition game theory that you will see even the wars etc happens because of different coalitions and you should mm -hmm. see the selfishness of i mean the people when they are making decisions that if you don't do that i mean i think you don't have a good view about the world that's at least my understanding and i think the people actually the students were quite good some of them actually at the end of the class they were playing with me so whenever i want to talk i said okay i will give you some bonuses i said no this bonus really does not help because you give the bonus to everyone so what's the benefit then so that's i think that's an interesting thing exactly the view that you mentioned that lots of things are worth essentially are games like testing verifications and other optimizations uh, so but but you have done actually i was uh, thing that like your first quarter in DBLT was Christos and the second one was Kusha uh, Tesami. So how did you, I mean, started, I mean, working with him and what are the main things? I think you were talking about the Nash equilibrium uh, stuff, but a, a bit different angles maybe. So you want to tell a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so, um, so Kusha, I don't know for people that don't know them, he's a great guy, he came to the labs in the 90s, yeah, and so we kept, uh, yeah. So we did a lot of work then with Rajiv Allur also. Rajiv is another great guy in uh, the has done uh, great uh, work, um, basically invented the uh, time automata and, uh, you know, the introducing time to um, uh, verification. And he has been doing great work in uh, Japan. Um, so and uh, we, we we have continued to go afterwards, and then uh, lately more with Kusha. It's uh, now at um, Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of uh, okay. We have done work on the in the Nash equilibria that you mentioned. We looked at the problem of uh, you know computing Nash equilibria. How do difficult is it? Um, if you want to actually compute an actual Nash equilibrium, okay, yeah. um, in the sense of, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, saying what the strategies are going to be like in the equilibrium. Um, and essentially, Nash equilibrium is the one that no agent wants to change his strategy unless others want to change it. Unless others want to change, right. And uh, so, the when we have, um, uh, you know, this applies when everybody has their own objectives, every player has their own way of estimating what they like. And uh, you may have two, three, four more players. So the, so the, the one thing that happens if uh, you go from multiple players is then, you know, even if the uh, description of the payoffs of the players are simple, let's say yes. integers or rationals, then the equilibrium may look very complicated. Yes. So the, 
they may be, be for example, irrational numbers for three players and up. Uh, and uh, but yeah. what was the rational number? Well, let's say the payoffs are integers. Let's say yes, or just rational numbers. Yes. But the equilibria themselves, the probabilities by which they play, the equilibria will be mixed strategies for yes. the players. So it will be probabilities by which they play the different strategies. So this equilibria may be very, you know, complicated. There may be rational numbers. There may be non-algebraic numbers. So they, I mean, mean you know, there may be no, irrational numbers. So they may be very complex. So anyway, so this four of three flavors in the box. So, so the um, so the computing the equilibrium is a difficult thing. So there is the, the there is a you know some um, uh, fundamental work of uh, you know by Christos and uh, Daskalakis and such and and uh, on um, uh, the equilibria, approximate equilibria, computing equilibria, where uh, a player can improve by a little, yes. or even in the two players exactly. So what we looked with Kusha is uh, the question of computing the actual equilibrium. Mm -hmm. You know, what is the, um, the, the coordinates of the actual equilibrium. Uh, you mean the epsilon Nash, correct? You are talking uh, about epsilon Nash, correct? Not epsilon Nash. So epsilon Nash is the notion that a player cannot improve by more than epsilon. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about Nash. Oh, the, the Nash actual itself, equilibrium yeah. computing. Nash. Let's say the strategy you play, you know, the probability you play strategy one is uh, 0.11. So yes. basically you play strategy two will be 0.237 and so forth, computing these numbers. Yeah. So this this uh, so this this problem of, of computing up approximately these numbers up to some precision. I see, I see, I see. That's uh, that's an even harder problem. It does not have anything with uh, epsilon Nash in that sense, correct? This is just uh, it says in the sense that uh, if you could compute those, you could compute also epsilon Nash. I, I see it, but so this, not in this. this. If you compute up to some precision, then these are just leave it at that precision, then that's an epsilon Nash. That's it's epsilon not the other exactly. way around, but an epsilon Nash would still be far away from the equilibrium. I see, I see. So that's, that's yeah. exactly it. Yeah. So, um, so we compute that, and that, for example, if it's a unique equilibrium, Suppose there is just one equilibrium. Will I play strategy one with probability close to zero or probability close to one? Yeah. That's a difficult question. That's it. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. So let's say there is a unique equilibrium. There's only unique Nash. Okay. Should I play, you know, and I have, let's say, three possible strategies. In that unique equilibrium, will I play strategy one with zero probability or with probability close to one? I see it. Even that we don't know, even for the first digit, essentially, we don't know the Right, so it's hard to, to decide that. And this is the pip at heart, of course, or some version. No, of... it's harder than that. Yeah, it's pip at heart, but it's above NP, it's beyond NP. Oh, I see, I see. So that's actually interesting. Uh, so that is... Uh... Uh, great. So, uh, and this is some of the results that you proved, correct? Uh, yeah, right. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so we have a class for this, um, for computing, uh, for this computing uh, solutions like that. I mean, uh, Nash or other problems up to some precision, let's say. Uh, and uh, you go ahead. Right. So th this is the class fixed P. That is... Uh, which is basically, it's the class is generally, you know, defined as computing fixed points of algebraic functions. And this happens even for two player Nash, correct? No, for two player Nash, it's always uh, rational. There is a oh, rational I see, see. that's for three player. And, uh, so rational, so for two players, you are in TP. As soon as you get three players, then you get these non-linearities. I see, I see. That's actually interesting. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, that I didn't see that one in the two player, but that is a uh, great. So uh, I think uh, one uh, 
uh, think is uh, this one. I think that maybe it is a good in the, uh, things uh, inter, uh, like point to mention. I think maybe we want to talk about two, three important uh, problems. I mean, it can be I mean theory, non-theory, yeah. but it uh, like in uh, these areas. I think uh, that would be uh, great to actually mention. I think for the people, young researcher who yeah. want to think about it. So um, let's say, I mean, so, so, so just uh, I'll, I'll come to that. You know, so the, the other kind of work we've been doing with Kushak has to do with um, uh, probabilistic systems, like or say, things where there is probability, and uh, there is also, uh, but it's not finite systems; it's infinite systems, so infinite uh, states. But uh, they are. Uh, described in such systematic finite way. So for example, recursive processes, you know, processes that regenerate themselves. Yeah. You can think of, for example, uh, recursive programs, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, even if it's a finite state program, if there is a recursion in it, it's gonna generate an infinite state process. Yes. Um, another thing is, um, there's something called branching processes in probability, which is like uh, you can think of uh, cells dividing, subdividing, subdividing, and so we have different types of uh, things, you know, objects that are entities that reproduce themselves. Uh, and then, uh, we have a population of objects growing of different types. Uh, and uh, are these also in game theory or? Um, they are not so they would be purely probabilistic processes that could be probabilistic. Yeah. But then if you think about if you are able to intervene, then you may get a game. So for example, you may have uh, some control in the reproduction. Yeah. And uh, there may be some other force that is opposing, you know, in the reproduction, you know, that is um, you know, you want to um, sort of achieve some, uh, for example, you are trying to optimize this reproduction to achieve some goal, for example, you're yeah. uh, sort of having, affecting the, you know, if you can think of, you know, let's say, put some medicine or put some, uh, you can uh, control the environment that controls this reproduction, then there is an optimization problem. What do you need to do? to achieve a certain goal to prevent, for example, the population from exploding or to do something. So problems like that, uh, so the, which is interesting kind of discrete descriptions, but then when you're going to analyze it, it's kind of continuous processes in a sense. It's a little bit like the Nash where it's a discrete description but the, it lives in a continuous space. You know, this probability is a continuous space. Continuous so it's, uh, you know, the, the existence follows a fixed point theorem, which is really talks about continuous functions in a continuous space. Yeah. So that's kind of the, you know, you know, the equations you'll get, you'll get equations, which are um, then um, in general, nonlinear equations in a continuous space, you know, you you want to compute these numbers. Yeah. For example, the probability of an event happening, something like that, or what is the best actions will be mixed actions that are with probability. Uh, are there some hardness in the fixed P uh, that you yeah, mentioned so for this problem? Them, so many of these, so some of these are hardness, which are like, I mean, live in a bigger space, not out, let's say where there is the word is continuous, not discrete. So the, uh, in general, the, you, they talk about uh, roots of polynomials, for example. So sort of you can, uh, the corresponding to NP would be existential theory of the real solutions, you know, solvability of polynomial equations as opposed to integer equations, you know, that, which is NP really. Yeah. And uh, computability would be you want to compute these quantities up to precision, but these are now nonlinear things. So there is live in a continuous space. So there, there is so that's something interesting. I think that's uh, basically 
I don't think we understand yet quite as well as the discrete space. I mean, the discrete we don't understand, of course, with the P versus NP, but uh, there is also the um, question about how does it interact when you are talking about um, quantities that are, you know, solving, uh, you know, living in a continuous space. Um, so that's, I think, it's interesting. Of course, the main major questions of, uh, you know, about games, there's lots of games that we do not know, discrete games, if they are NP or NP. Uh, I don't know, you, I'm sure you are familiar with the stochastic games, simple stochastic games. Yes, that's games. one of the, yeah. There were some, some theorems, essentially, more recently, about some versions of them that, uh, I think we didn't know whether they are in P or not. There were some stock paper, I think maybe two years ago. I think this was the same type of thing that Lassie uh, Babai uh, proved for uh, subgraph heart, uh, subgraph. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you are thinking of, um, so one of the games is called the parity game. Yeah, the parity game. Yeah, the yes, parity yes. game. Yeah. So the, this is the parity game is a game which comes out of the verification, you know, for uh, yes. verification of uh, you know, in some model, some properties. And I think for uh, that, we have some hardness. So this is, no, we don't have the hardness. So this is, uh, so the result you refer to was a quasi-polynomial algorithm, but this problem can be solved in quasi-polynomial time. Quasi-polynomial, exactly. Yeah. Yes, so, but, uh, so this is, uh, uh, so, so we do, do not know if it's in polynomial time, Right, I mean the set of equation, but before that there was only exponential algorithms. Yeah, uh, I think that was similar to graph isomorphism. That was the thing that is work of uh, I think Lassie Babai that also he had it quasi polynomial time algorithm. Yeah, example. yeah, but it's yeah, it's uh, it's similar in the sense that it's quasi polynomial, but it's not related in any formal way. Neither reduces to the other or any, anything like that. Yeah, but because actually we were working on that problem. And that was my guess. I mentioned to a student actually because this obtained this was this parity game was one of the things that we didn't know whether it is polynomial or not. I suggested actually to some of the students that because now uh, uh, graph isomorphism has this also might have such a thing. But that was interesting. I, I, I read the paper actually. I think I read that parity things. Yeah, I couldn't see. I mean, exactly the, somehow formal things between this and. Uh, Graph yeah, isomorphism, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. in a sense, maybe motivation that now it exists such a thing. Let's try for that. But for no, a stochastic really, game, it's still open. It, it is open. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's open. so parity game reduces to simple stochastic game. Yes. Uh, so one open questions, for example, does the quasi polynomial can one do in quasi polynomial or even polynomial time? Now all these games have what uh, one thing they have in common is that they are in NP intersect coin P. Yes. Uh, which is, so they, this is actually, I think, very intriguing more generally. This, you know, problems NP intersect coin P, in the particular problems, PFNP problems. All of these are PFNP problems. Uh, total functions in NP, total search problems in NP. Yeah. Well, if you have a solution, you are guaranteed to have a solution. And, uh, Nash is an example like that. Two player Nash, for example. Good. So I think I to summarize for this pun, I will say one is the a, a simple. I think uh, a stochastic games, whether they are in polynomial or not, uh, and even the simple stochastic game, we don't know that one. We know par about parity, but not simple stochastic game, because it's like parity games are a special kinds of simple stochastic games, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but that's quasi-polynomial. Polynomial. That's quasi-polynomial also, yeah. not the yeah. polynomial yeah, yeah. time. Not and polynomial. the other one is that all this problem in the intersection of NP versus co-NP, essentially. Yeah, that, and, that's... And, uh, and moreover, search problems that are total, where I, there is guaranteed to be a solution. I think all of these are, you know, like PLS, local search problems, finding a local optimum, yes. like Nash equilibrium, you know, for two players. Um, you know, these games, simple stochastic games, finding the optimal strategies uh, and the optimal values or parity games. All of these are problems in TFNP, basically. Yeah, so, so in general, there is lots of other problems in there which 
really are not MP complete. And uh, some of those are for sure MP. But we don't know it yet. So I think, uh, yeah, so these are the type of problem that we know that exist such as things, but the path to reaching there, if you want to do local improvement, that might be, I mean, essentially exponential. The question right. is that, can we go faster and reach those guys essentially? That's right, yes, yeah. Uh, good, so that's about this. So what, uh, these are, of course, these are nice problems. What else? So what other simple basic problem that we know. Is there anything in approximation that you think that is still, I mean, there are, of course, uh, improving this, bonds that exist, I don't know, for TSP, we don't know the exact things, Steiner Forest, I mean, there are several other problems that we don't know. But are there other things that, like, more general or important problem that you have in your mind for approximation? Uh, well, I mean, there is, uh, I, for approximation, I mean, it's, uh, I think, the, I mean, the, the PCP gave us a good handle on the P task versus no P task. Um, uh, you know, one thing is, is there something similar for constant versus non constant? Well, PCP gives some leverage, but I don't know. And, uh, and of course, there is the prominent uh, unique gain conjecture. Exactly. Or unique gain conjecture is, of course, um, uh, you know, would be a major step, uh, you know, major thing over there. Um, so, so there is still things we don't know. Now it's uh, it's become more difficult. But <laughs> I mean, already PCP is you know very deep theorem. Deep theorem. Um, but uh, you know, I'm sure we'll see some more deep theorems there. Yeah. Uh, uh, good. And uh, is there any other? Things in databases or verification or others, I think maybe in the other areas that the people are also interested to uh, know about it. I mean, there is plethora of, of concrete problems. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one area that is, I mean, one thing that is, um, I mean, that is, will be good to get a better understanding is, uh, you know, the in terms of analysis on lab algorithm, that is beyond worst case analysis, you know, yes. sort of understanding a little bit better of what, you know, what should we be measuring that is rigorous and, you know, gives a little more insight about performance of algorithms um, yeah. than a worst case sort of or simple probabilistic case. So there is the smooth model. So there's some, uh, you know, I've been looking a little at smooth analysis, but uh, you know, there is um, still, I mean, there's a question of developing better models that can tell us a little more about, you know. Yeah, actually, the, I mean, this is one, one of the- Realistic performance of algorithms. Yeah, yeah so I think uh, we, uh, this is one other thing, actually, we were reading your paper quite a bit, this uh, London Yanakakis. So this was one uh, paper that we had it, I think, with uh, David Johnson and Howard Karloff, Maurice Sears, and several other authors. This was uh, from a problem that we had it at at and It was a real world problem. And it turns out, essentially, we need to run some kinds of set cover instances. And we had 400 instances of this problem from the real world. And the simple greedy algorithms in 399 of them gave us the best solution. And you know, I mean, you know better than anyone that it's like an approximation in the worst case. But in 399, it gave the best solution because we could check it actually with a linear program. And some of them we could actually find the solution using simple x. And in one instance, it was not the best solution, just plus one off. And even there, if you had some kind of, there was some tie breaking. If you change that tie breaking, you could even get that one thing. So in some sense, I mean, yes, we know it is log and hard, but in practice, this greedy works well, essentially. The same thing in some sense, actually, I want to say, uh, also about the, this deep nets. I mean, there's for a long time, the people say, okay, we don't know anything. Still, we don't know that much. Even very simple one, this kind of word to vec. There are some people try to find some theory. These are just 
deep network with one hidden layer. And we don't know still why this gives a good solution, at least theoretically, or this one. But they are working very well in practice. I think in general, getting these algorithms, as you mentioned, like this in some sense, these are the beyond the worst case, essentially, that yes, in worst case, maybe these nets, they cannot get anything. But in practice, especially with the real world instances, they can do much, much better. And understanding this, I think that's actually very important thing that I'm thinking right. about it for right. a long time. The work well. is not vicious always and pathological and crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it's maybe better than, yeah. So that's, uh, you know, he has having some rigorous understanding of that, a better rigorous, I mean, there is some work, but some better rigorous understanding that would be important. Yeah. Uh, great. So, and uh, I think one <laughs> interesting thing that you work actually lots of areas, as you mentioned, I mean, these are not directly related, but of course, your knowledge about the whole thing uh, helped a lot. Do you think, I mean, do you uh, think it is possible that nowadays you are doing, because of course, that was, you were early time of computer science, you had some of these like conferences, maybe even like POTS was not even uh, there at the beginning. So do you think it still is possible to work in different areas or the people should try to do that multidisciplinary or, I mean, you think that you should focus more on one area and maybe go deeper in that area, especially for PhD students or young researchers? Well, um, I think it's, I mean, both. <laughs> I think it's good to have your eyes, first of all, be aware of things be beyond your narrow focus, even if you don't work on it. I think it's good to be aware of the world outside the very narrow focus. Uh, you know, I mean, in the, especially PhD students, young students have to focus. I mean, and they have to um, have a focus, write a thesis, they have to get, uh, you know, they have to make their mark on something. So they, they so that requires digging deep into a problem and uh, you know having you know getting some good results. But uh, in the long run, I mean I think it's good to to have breadth, I mean and have I mean you cannot be very, I mean you don't want to be, you know, waste your time reading about everything. Exactly, but uh, uh, it's good to be able to talk to our other colleagues, you know, in uh, other fields. Sometimes, you know, ideas from one field are useful in another field, so that may actually make for uh, fruitful, you know, collaborations, which are both good, you know, I mean, satisfying in terms of, you know, uh, the. Personal, at a personal level, but also, you know, may give actually results in sites which uh, would not be possible without you know, without actually opening up. So in the long run, I think it's good to, to have some bread. In the, for the initial stages, I think then you, uh, you do go, you have to focus and get, you know, get some good results in your main uh, expertise, you know, get your expertise sharpened and you know gets uh be focused uh, uh, uh great yeah so um i think uh, this is one actually example that i mentioned for me it has been the case the best way to understand a new research i mean a new area is to just do some research there because when you read you may forget about after some time but if you think mm -hmm. the research i mean if there is some collaborator in the other field then you will i think it's a very good opportunity that you will learn because then you will think about it and you will understand it much better than reading. Because I think yeah. like even <laughs> I forget the things essentially that I read. I agree. And talking to the people in that uh, that work in that field, that you learn uh, better that way. If you find a common problem to work with, you know that's that's a good way to go. Uh, the uh, things. So actually, one other question that is also related to this. So they ask. Uh, I mean, do you have? Uh, I mean, children. And I think that's the next question that I want to ask. Do you have any also like? Yes, maybe you want to answer this, I will ask the second question. We have yeah. children, what do they do essentially, have, if you want to share? Yeah, I have a daughter, she's yeah. grown up now, yeah. Uh, she's in uh, literature, she's, she studied comparative literature, she's a poet. Yeah. And, um, you know, she's, um, 
uh, jobs. He's uh, not computer scientist. Not computer. And you didn't uh, try to, I think, to persuade her for computer science. Uh, no, I mean she can choose what she likes. So, so she uh, she likes more the written work. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, we are writing a lot of work as well, so I think, but in the field of computer science, yeah, this is like, yeah. I think the number of papers that we write is probably more than mathematicians or others. So, and do we have any, I mean, like uh, uh, somehow related to this question, do we have any, I mean, message for higher schoolers that they want to do, I mean, computer science or they I mean, maybe they have not even chosen computer science, they want to do anything. So what yeah, do you think I, it was? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't, uh, the... For high school students, I mean, they, I think you have to be open basically and see what you like, what excites you the most. Uh, that usually is correlated with, with what you are good at. Uh, usually, what you are good at, it, that's what gives you satisfaction because you get results. <laughs> yeah. So, and, uh, but then it's really what, what you find most exciting that's more likely you're going to be successful in that and uh, will give you more satisfaction in the long run. So that's, uh, it's hard to tell, plus it may change as you go along. So you may be exposed to new things. For example, I was not exposed to computer science until graduate school, essentially. So that's, um, you know, you're, you may want to be flexible and, and so, you know, you may end up going in some uh, direction, but then, you know, seeing that the next direction is more exciting. Yeah, so because I think I can put it as a concrete problem. The concrete problem is that, I mean, you know, something is hot topic. I think you've been discussed actually this one, even for like for electrical engineering versus maybe math or other. So this is some hot topic things. And this is maybe these are your interests. So the question is that what is the threshold that you should go more to? I mean, of course, you may not hate the hot topic, but maybe your interest is a bit different from them. So which one, is there any, I mean, I, of course we cannot solve it, but any suggestion that, is there any threshold or you should do it maybe pause for a while? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is like something that I try to. Well, yeah, the, I mean, uh, high school, you are learning, you are still uh, exploring. And so even in uh, as an undergraduate, you are really exploring, exploring. So you, you have to learn and you follow one direction and, uh, but then, you know, you graduate, you may find out that, uh, you want to do something else that's perfectly fine yeah i think so i think maybe the solution is somehow is that maybe you should not decide at high school even i will say undergrad maybe it's still too soon try to learn these areas as much yeah. as you can i think that's the time that's probably a good time for you to learn and leap it yeah. essentially learn it in a deep way and then later on i mean when it reaches then you have much more information to decide in a much better way than just yeah, there yeah, are some people yeah. maybe a start very soon and they are very successful, but mm -hmm. maybe the more <laughs> like the optimized way is that you will continue for a while and then at some point you decide that okay, I decided that yeah. this is the, my field that I want to continue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, great. So I think is there any other research areas or that you want to talk about or any people you want to thank or like you any know, last uh, word you want to add? Uh, uh, no, I think we have covered lots of grounds. I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, lucky to have supported people all the way along the way. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, I mean, there's always good professors and mentors. So I think uh, most students will be able to find people to inspire them. I hope they do, because then uh, that makes it so much easier. So uh, I think we've covered in terms of research areas, problems, I think we've covered enough ground here. Yeah. And we mentioned several people, I think also that you mentioned about different part that you had the effect essentially yeah. on your yeah, yeah. So research I, I, and I like Jeff Fulman, my advisor, and uh, you know, as an undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate thesis advisor, you know, uh, uh, Manuel, uh, Manuel Protonotarios, he guided me to communication theory. So that's what got me excited in that, you know, communication theory. 
But uh, in general, there have been, uh, you know, Alejo at the labs and, you know, lots of other people, you know, lots of colleagues, you know, Christos uh, has been like lifelong uh, collaboration. Yeah. Know, and he joined you, you uh, yeah, he joined Colombia as well, I think. <laughs> That's also yeah, yeah, so he's uh, my neighbor now, right? So he's uh, <laughs> uh, finally saw the light and came to Colombia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, right. So he's, um, and uh, you know, lots of other day collaborators have had, you know, Kusha and uh, Tasami, David V, Taki Valu, you know, lots of people, you know, lots of people at Belabs, you know, David Johnson, who I think he was your department head, he's a great yeah. guy, so he uh, was a great friend, you know, for many years, you know, that's... Uh, and yeah, he was a great, actually, I always say that he was the best manager that I had it in my life. I'm very proud to mention that. <laughs> yeah. There are several other companies that I can't say completely reverse, but I think for him, I learned a lot from him. And yeah. unfortunately, I mean, he had this thing that I mean, he passed away, but uh, this is like, yeah, I think he yeah. was great, actually. He was a great guy, yeah, great friend, yeah. Uh, so, great, yeah. Yeah, that's Lots of people, yeah. Uh, okay, so thanks a lot for your time. I think it was great. I learned a lot. I always say that these are actually good. I learned a lot from these things. And some of these also we try to make essentially these are like the history of the things that we are seeing now. I think it is important that all the time that I talk, I will say, oh, these are some of these that now I see the directions much better <laughs> the way that is there. Like, yeah, I have talked with lots of other people like Peter Shore, Madhu Sudan and others. I think these are like the time that we try to do it in this kind of series of live to say something that's there. It is recorded also for the future pe people or future audience to look at it and see how is it going. And of course, hopefully this may have some effect about the future path as well. Uh, thanks for uh, your time here. And I think I enjoyed it. And I hope that the people will enjoy it also over time. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mohammed. And uh, that's actually... Uh, good service we are doing there, talking to all the people and uh, sort of putting it all, <laughs> you know, having the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, great. Uh, so that sounds good. And uh, talk to you and <laughs> later and my audience for yeah. now. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Uh, thanks. Bye. <laughs>